This episode brought to you by MeepleRealty.com, your source for high-quality custom board game inserts. Meeple Realty, think inside the box. Hey everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we're bringing you a how to play Euphoria video. This is gonna be all the instructions you need to get started playing Euphoria, build a better dystopia. So without anything else, let's get right into this worker placement game and I'll show you how to play. Oh, and one more thing, if you like what you see here, if you think Euphoria might be a game for you, consider purchasing it from the link in the description below. A small portion of that will go to help the channel. All right, let's get into the game. Euphoria is a worker placement game in which the dice are the player's workers. The number on each die represents that worker's level of knowledge. If the player's workers ever collectively become too knowledgeable about the dystopia in which they live, some of them may desert the player's cause. The player also begins the game with an elite recruit who has pledged allegiance to her cause. As the game progresses, the player will find other elite recruits willing to pledge their allegiance as well. The player's goal is to place all 10 of her authority tokens and claim victory. She will accomplish this in part by constructing markets, gathering artifacts, gathering commodities, and gathering resources. When setting up the game, first set out the game board. The game board is divided into four sections, each of which is controlled by a different faction. This city on the left side of the board with the red borders is controlled by the Euphorians. Outside the city walls on the right side of the board are the hovels and farms of the Wastelanders outlined in brown. The subterrans are found underground at the bottom of the board outlined in blue. And finally, at the top of the board in the clouds is where the Icarites live in their zeppelins outlined in green. Shuffle the recruit cards and deal four to each player. Each player then chooses two cards and discards the other two face down. These discarded recruit cards are returned to the box and not shuffled back into the deck. All players then simultaneously reveal one of their chosen recruit cards, leaving the other face down hidden from the other players. The face up recruit is a player's active recruit and provides the listed special ability. The active recruit also allows a player to benefit from the allegiance bonuses of that faction. We'll talk more about special abilities and allegiance bonuses a little bit later. As the game progresses, players will be able to activate their hidden recruit as well. When this occurs, the player gains access to any allegiance bonuses belonging to that faction if it differs from the original recruit. Place the remaining recruit deck near the game board. Each player receives one multiplier marker to keep track of resources and commodities in the event there aren't enough. This multiplier is used simply by placing a resource or commodity on it, and in this case, this one food token would count as three food tokens. Shuffle the artifact deck and place it near the game board as well. If at any time during the game the artifact deck is exhausted, shuffle its discard pile to form a new deck. The unavailable territory markers are placed on each of the territory stars so that the remaining number of spaces equals the number of players. So a two-player game would look like this. Ethical dilemma cards are shuffled and one is dealt to each player. Once a player is dealt her ethical dilemma card, she may look at her own card, but she then will keep the card face down and hidden from other players. On the back of the Ethical Dilemma card is a reference sheet for the commodities, resources, allegiance points, and other miscellaneous icons. Each player collects the tokens of her color and then places her morale token on the far left space of the morale chart and her knowledge token on the plus three space of the knowledge chart. The resources of gold, clay, and stone are each placed on the board next to their respective tunnels. The energy is placed next to the generator, 
the water is placed next to the aquifer, the food next to the farm, and the bliss next to the cloud nine. It's very important for players to keep in mind the difference between resources and commodities, as certain game effects will reference one or the other. Players should collect two of their worker dice, leave the remaining dice grouped together, forming a recruitable pool of workers. Place an unavailable action space marker at the end of each of the three tunnels. Shuffle the marker tiles and place one face down on each of the six market construction sites. It's important that these tiles are placed within the guidelines of the box provided. Then set the remaining market tiles back in the box. Place a progress token on each of the start locations of the Allegiance track. Place a minor meeple on the start space of each of the three mines. Each player then collects her 10 authority tokens. Finally, players determine the first player by rolling their two worker dice. The highest roll wins, and if there's a tie, the oldest player wins that tie. This roll that the players just made also is their starting knowledge. Now, moving on to the gameplay, during a player's turn, she must do one of the following two actions. The first option available to a player is to place exactly one of her available workers on the board. A worker is considered an available worker if it is both under your control and not yet on the board. If a player has multiple workers which have identical knowledge levels at the beginning of her turn, as these two do, she may place all of these workers during the same turn, one after the other. If through some game effect, a worker were to gain the same knowledge as the ones currently being placed, it would not be allowed to be placed as part of that benefit. When a player places one or more workers, that player immediately gains the listed benefit as soon as they place each worker. We'll discuss worker placement in more detail momentarily. Instead of placing a worker, the second option a player has is to retrieve any number of her workers from the board. The player can retrieve some or all of her workers. However, retrieving any or all of a player's workers is not free. To retrieve the workers, the player must pay her choice of retrieval cost. The player may pay either one food or one bliss to retrieve any number of workers and in doing so gains two morale. Or as an alternative, the player may simply lose one morale to retrieve any or all of her workers. While we're looking at this chart, it's a good time to mention that across the board, costs are always located in a gray square while benefits are in a white circle. When a new player initially looks at the board, it can be a little bit overwhelming at the apparent abundance of options available to that player. However, it can be helpful to realize that there are actually only three different types of action spaces on the board. And these action spaces can be easily identified as the light gray squares or rectangles. So let's take a look at the three different kinds of action spaces available. A dotted light gray square with an arrow to the right is called a temporary use space. A player may place a worker on this type of action space even if there's already another worker there. Doing so bumps the other worker back to its owner at no cost to that player. A player may even bump her own worker if she wishes. The owner of the bump worker immediately rolls that worker and then adds it to her available workers. As previously discussed, the benefit of one of these spaces will be located beneath it in a white circle. In this case, the player either gets a stone or an artifact card. Some of these temporary use action spaces have a cost associated with them. In this case, a water. The cost will always be directly to the left of the action space and as previously discussed, in a gray square. A worker placed on a temporary use action space will remain there until either retrieved or bumped. 
A slight variation on the temporary use action space is the exclusive action space. These are located at the end of a tunnel and are blocked at the beginning of a game, but eventually may become available. We'll discuss more about tunnels and these spaces a little bit later. The second of the three types of action spaces is the multi-use action space. A multi-use action space is represented by one large light gray rectangle and any number of workers may be placed here. The final type of action space is the one-time use space. This is a solid gray square with no arrow and a resource cost inside of it. In order to place a worker on this space, the player must pay the associated cost. So in this case, a player must first pay one clay from her resource pile, and then she could place a worker on that space. A player cannot be bumped from a one-time use space. Keep in mind the following order of operations when placing one of your workers in an action space. First, bump any worker already in that space if possible. Second, pay any cost associated with that space. And third, gain the benefit listed for that space. After a player finishes her turn, the player to her left will then take his turn. And it will continue this way clockwise around the table. Player turn order never changes and in fact it becomes irrelevant as the game continues on. The morale of each player's workers is tracked on the morale chart. A player's morale determines how many artifact cards she may hold at any given time. Anytime a player finds herself holding more cards than her current morale, she must discard down to the appropriate number immediately. If an effect has a player draw a card which will cause her to be over that limit, she may draw the card first and then choose which card to discard. If a player is at the far right of the morale track, she may still take an action that would normally increase her morale. The same is true for the far left of the morale track. The player may essentially retrieve her workers for free in that case. However, if a recruit card would allow a player to lose morale in exchange for a benefit, she must have enough morale to make that exchange. The knowledge of your workers is tracked on this chart. Knowledge represents how aware your workers are of the true nature of the world around them. Players will need to be mindful of their workers' total knowledge levels because if their collective knowledge gets too high, they will begin to abandon your cause and flee from the dystopia around them. Anytime a player retrieves one or more workers from the board for any reason, she immediately rolls them and then checks their collective knowledge. If the sum of the knowledge of all available workers plus the player's current knowledge level is greater than or equal to 16, the player's most knowledgeable worker is immediately lost and placed back in the pool of recruitable workers. In this case, six plus three is nine, plus three is 12, the knowledge check is passed and the player does not lose any workers. However, if this was the situation the player found herself in, six plus five is 11, plus five is 16, then the level six knowledge worker would flee from the dystopia. If the highest knowledge worker is tied with another worker, only one of them is lost. A player can never lose more than one worker in this way per turn. Let's go over a few important things to remember regarding knowledge. Only available workers count towards a player's knowledge total. Any workers still on the board do not count during a knowledge check. So in this case, six plus three is nine plus three is 12. This worker would put that player over the knowledge limit. However, this worker is still on the board. Therefore, it is not an available worker and therefore it does not count towards the knowledge check. Also, if a player is at the far right of the knowledge track, she may still take actions that normally increase her knowledge level. The same applies for the far left of the knowledge track. However, if a recruit requires a player to gain a certain amount of knowledge in exchange for a benefit, that player must have low enough knowledge to make the exchange. Now let's take a quick look at the different locations players can place their workers. 
During the course of the game, a player likely will want to increase her number of workers. A player may add a worker by placing one of her available workers in the worker activation tank. The worker activation tank actually provides two different options. For this option, the player must pay three energy and then lose two knowledge and gain one worker. Alternatively, the player can pay three water, gain two morale, and gain one worker. After paying the necessary price and adjusting either morale or knowledge, the player then rolls her new worker and checks her total knowledge. It should be noted that even if a player has no more workers available to recruit, she may still place a worker on the worker activation tank in order to raise morale or lower knowledge. Also keep in mind that despite its location in the lower portion of the board, the worker activation tank is not part of Subterra. Commodities in the game are each collected at one of the four commodity areas on the board. I already mentioned the generator, cloud mine, farm, and aquifer earlier in this video, but now let me show you how they actually work. The number of commodities a player collects when she places a worker on one of these areas is determined by the total knowledge of all players' workers on that area after the placement of the new worker. So what exactly does that mean? After this worker was placed, there's a total of five knowledge in this area, and so the player gains one water and loses one knowledge. If the next player places a worker in this area, there's now six total knowledge, and so that player will also gain one water and lose one knowledge. If the blue player later plays another worker on this area, there's now a total of nine knowledge at the aquifer, and so now that player will gain two water and gain one knowledge. Keep in mind a player will only gain the benefit of the space on the turn she places her worker and not on future turns when other workers are placed in the same space. The generator, aquifer, farm, and cloud mine all have the same ratios of knowledge to gained benefit. 1 to 4 total knowledge in this space gains the player 1 commodity and advances the allegiance track by 1. Advancing the allegiance track is not optional even if it may not be in the player's best interest. 5 to 8 knowledge gains 1 commodity and loses 1 knowledge. And 9 plus knowledge in this space gains the player 2 commodities and 1 knowledge on the knowledge track. And remember, commodities are not limited by the number of tokens in the game, and players should use the multiplier board if they run out of tokens. Each faction, other than the Icarites, is trying to tunnel into one of the other faction's territories in order to gain access to the commodities produced by that faction. However, the very process of tunneling provides its own benefits in the form of both resources and artifacts. This is an example of one of the three tunnels, where you can see the Wastelanders are trying to tunnel into Euphoria to gain access to energy. Any player, regardless of allegiance, may place a worker on this temporary use action space, pay the cost, in this case food, and then gain either, in this case clay, or an artifact card. The player then moves the Minor Meeple one space. When the Minor Meeple gets moved to the sixth space of the tunnel, which has this symbol on it, all players with a hidden recruit of that faction activate the recruit. In this case, it's the Wastelander faction, and this recruit would be activated if it had previously been hidden. It doesn't matter which player moves the Meeple to this space, all players activate their associated hidden recruit. When a miner reaches the end of the tunnel, a new exclusive action becomes available. From this point forward in the game, any player with an active recruit of that faction may place workers on the space. So if the blue player had an active recruit of the Wastelander faction, she could place her worker here and gain three energy. Also, it's important to note that even if the tunnel is completed, players may still use this temporary action space to gain the listed benefits. 
For a market to be constructed, a number of workers must be assigned to it based on the number of players playing the game. This chart on the board will help you remember exactly how many spaces you need to use. In a two to three player game, any two spaces. In a four player game, any three spaces. And in a five or six player game, all four spaces must be used. Any player may contribute to building a market by placing her worker on the one time use space and paying the indicated cost. If a player removes her worker from a construction site for any reason prior to completion of the site, she does not receive a refund for the cost she paid. Also, another worker will need to replace that worker paying any associated cost before the site may be constructed. Once a market tile is completed, flip it over and slide it to the left. This reveals the temporary use action space it was covering. Sliding the tile to the left also bumps the workers back to the players who own them, who also then immediately roll them. Each player who contributed at least one worker to the construction site places exactly one authority token on the market. Players do not get additional authority tokens on that market if they provided more than one worker. Any player who does not have an authority token on the market tile will incur the penalty indicated. So you can see in this case, if a player did not have an authority token on this market, then every time that player rolled a five, she would lose either one commodity or one resource. Once a market is constructed, a player can exchange various goods for plots of land in that faction's territory. All players have access to a market regardless of whether they assisted in its construction. To visit a market, the player places her available worker on the temporary use action space at the top right of the market and pays the indicated cost. So in this case, the player would need to pay both any commodity and a baseball bat artifact. Once that cost is paid, the player then advances the corresponding allegiance track one space and then places one authority token on an empty territory space in that area of the board. If there are no empty territory spaces in that area of the board, then no authority token is placed, but the player still advances the corresponding allegiance track. This is an artifact market. Unlike the markets built at the construction sites, artifact markets come pre-built at the start of the game. A player may place a worker on the artifact market and pay three artifact cards of any type or two artifact cards of the same type. In return, the allegiance token indicated advances one space and the player receives one authority token in one of two possible places. As with a regular market, the player may place an authority token on the territory of that section of the board or a corresponding constructed market that does not already have that player's authority token may gain that authority token. By choosing this option, the player now no longer suffers the indicated penalty of that market. Players are allowed to continue placing workers on an artifact market to advance the allegiance track, even if there's nowhere to place their authority tokens. The Icarites, located at the top of the board, possess insidious motives and a traitor mentality, and for those reasons, act a little differently than the other people of this world. Players may not place authority tokens in any markets in Icarus, and they all are pre-built at the beginning of the game. The Wind Saloon allows a player to pay three of any artifact or two of the same artifact to advance the Icarite Allegiance by one space and place one authority token in an empty Icarite territory. At the Nimbus Loft, a player pays any combination of three resources to advance the Icarite Allegiance track by one space and place one authority token on an empty Icarite territory. At the Breeze Bar, a player pays one of any non-Bliss commodity and one bliss to advance the Icarite Allegiance track by one space and draw two artifact cards. At the Sky Lounge, a player pays one of any non-bliss commodity 
and one bliss to advance the Icarai Elitist track by one space and gain any two resources. So what exactly is this Allegiance track I keep talking about? Let's take a closer look at it. Workers cannot be placed on the Allegiance track. Instead, it is a method for tracking the strength of each faction. Anytime a player gains an Allegiance point for a faction, the corresponding row's marker is advanced one space. Each faction has several bonuses that can be unlocked as their Allegiance track advances. However, a player only has access to a bonus if she has an active recruit from that faction. Also, keep in mind, Allegiance track bonuses are cumulative, so even after the marker moves beyond one bonus into the next, the previous bonus remains active. So let's take a look at exactly what these bonuses are. Tier 1, which begins at Space 2, provides an extra commodity for the commodity belonging to that particular faction. Once this tier is activated, place the corresponding bonus marker on the board next to that commodity to help players remember to take the bonus. Tier 2, which is Space 5 and beyond, changes the tunnel bonus from OR to AND, allowing players to now gain both the corresponding resource and an artifact card. The Icarite Tier 2 bonus is a little bit different since they don't have a tunnel. When their Tier 2 bonus is activated, players who place an Authority token in the Icarite territory also draw an artifact card. Tier 3, which is Space 8 and beyond, causes any player with a hidden recruit of that faction to activate that recruit. These recruits now provide players with their special abilities as well as any bonuses for that faction. If a player has more than one recruit of the same faction, they do not increase the faction bonus. Tier 4, which is the last space, causes each player to place one authority token on each active recruit card they have of that faction. Once Tier 4 is reached, players may continue to place workers on spaces that would normally increase the Allegiance track, but the marker simply does not move any further. If, through the course of the game, a player receives a new recruit whose Allegiance track has already reached the third tier, then that recruit will automatically be activated. If that same Allegiance track has already reached the fourth tier, then the player will place an authority token on that recruit as well. Let's discuss these recruits in a little bit more detail. Many recruits, such as this one, allow the player to make an exchange. This is a limited exchange and must be performed exactly as prescribed. Some recruits allow the player to sacrifice workers. The sacrifice worker is placed back into the recruitable pool of workers. This ability may not be used if it would result in the player having zero workers. Some recruits ask you to compare a worker's knowledge to other recruits. If the worker needs to have the highest or lowest, it cannot be tied for that position. Some recruits change the way you draw artifact cards. You may not combine those types of abilities. Some recruits give you a bonus when you use a worker to bump another worker. When that happens, the bump occurs first, then everything else related to that action space happens. Let's discuss the Ethical Dilemma cards in a little bit more detail. A player may not do anything else on the turn she completes her Ethical Dilemma card. To complete the card, the player first reveals the card and then either discards two artifact cards of any type or the exact artifact card indicated. The player then has a choice. Does she fight the establishment, which lets her draw two recruits and keep one face down? Or does she contribute to the dystopia and immediately place one authority token on the ethical dilemma card? A player may trade with any other player during her turn. When a trade occurs, it occurs immediately, and the exchange must happen exactly as agreed upon. The game ends immediately as soon as a player has all 10 of her authority tokens on the board. It is possible through certain effects that two players or more could have 10 authority tokens on the board at the same time. 
With that in mind, the tiebreakers are as follows. Highest morale, then lowest knowledge, then the most markets with the player's authority tokens on them, then the most territories with at least one authority token on them, and if players are still tied, they roll all their active workers and the lowest total wins. And that's how you play Euphoria. There are some advanced rules and some variants on page 11 of the rulebook, but I'll leave that up to you to discover. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found it useful and informative. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel as well. You can also follow me over on Twitter at Board Offline. And until next time, if you're bored online, board offline.